How do you think this history is impacting what we see today? It's history, but it's not just history. I'm sure there's things, not only that, but um, what ideas do you have about this understanding that will influence your leadership on the commission as you're looking at, you know, some of the stuff you talked about? Feel free to just jump in. And for me, it's really important for us to recognize this history and understand it, that it's still very present today, even though all these things happened maybe a hundred years ago or even more recently, that doesn't mean that they're just over now, but like there's still residual effects that are ingrained in a lot of our land use planning systems and just in a lot of people's general behavior from day to day. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah I, I, I received an inter interesting card about the real realtors in 1919 where they uh, were part of the other yeah, realtor board part of their ethical code was uh, basically discriminating against non-white populations i mean i knew that but i didn't know it was part of their ethical code ethical code so that was really striking you know because like i was talking to nick and he mentioned that you know the ethics is kind of what we're trying to strive for you know and so then that got me thinking well what's in our ethical code today and you know, are we going to be changing, you know, in like 100 years from now, or is, is there something in there that it's going to be, you know, <laughs> whatever. Just yeah, for me, it was just to see the government's role and what was mm -hmm. happening. I mean, so, so I read uh, a few cards in each one just to see the, the state's role and to recognize as commissioners serving on a state commission, our responsibility and um, authority to to address it at, at at least to the extent that we can on this commission. The, the thing I'd add to what Commissioner Warren said about you know still feeling the impact of some of these things today, I, I think it's a good realization for us to recognize that that these that these inequities didn't have expiration dates, even though it, what might have been a racist or or unfair law. Was say um, taken, uh, you know, made made ineffective in in. Well, I'll use the Fair Housing Act, right? So, legal housing discrimination was made illegal in 1968, more than 50 years ago today. But the inequities that that system had created persist today. So, you know, we can go into every single system and see that. And and so that's the important part of history to me is that um, it's not that we need to we need to first understand and, and acknowledge it, but acknowledge that the impacts today are still exist and. Also recognize that part, uh, they still exist today to some degree because they are being perpetuated by a system that um, has a stake in perpetuating it. Thank you. How about folks uh, online here? Do you want to share anything? You, we only gave you a short little bit of like early history of Oregon, but I think it's enough to give you a flavor. Yeah, go go for it, Emily. Uh, it was interesting. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting because we were talking about um, Commissioner Jacobson grew up in Oregon and I grew up in Florida. So I think it was interesting just being like, did you learn that? And like, what did you learn versus what did I learn? And just the East Coast in, you know, we were talking about um, kind of the perception of the Oregon Trail and like, did when did I know that versus when did she know that? And um, kind of, uh, she can speak for her, her experience, but just like the, um, uh, stereotypes or, or erasure of, of Native Americans, um, where in the East Coast, you know, we had like the pilgrims and the in Indians and how everybody got along <laughs> uh, <laughs> versus uh, her experience. I think the other thing was just an interesting thing we read about um, specific discrimination where the law said, you know, requiring all Blacks, Chinese, Hawaiians, and mulattoes to pay a tax, an annual tax. And if they didn't, they kind of went into indentured servitude. Um, you know, that there was that much diversity that they had to like call out all the, <laughs> all the race, all the race, racial diversity. I thought that was um, interesting in, in kind of that history. Yeah, I was, um, there was some growing up in Oregon, there was parts of this uh, history. Um, I think this that I had knew. Excuse me. Of me. Oh, my microphone fell again. Is that better? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There was parts of this history that I knew and parts that I didn't, but I um, was sharing with Anale just how um, the Oregon Trail was really taught in school when I was kids. So fourth grade was all Oregon Trail all the time. And it was really this very positive, very like 
rugged adventure. And um, a couple of years ago after my mom died and I was going through her house and she saved everything. And I was sharing with my daughter, my like fourth grade organ trail projects. Yes. My daughter was like, oh my, like just mortified uh, because there was like a map and we like picked out land that we wanted um, you know, with no, um, thought that that actually belonged to someone else when you were picking it out. And, you know, then there's all these little scenarios like, oh no, you know, the natives came and stole your cows. What are you going to do kind of stuff? And just how whitewashed, um, of an education that was in terms of what the Oregon trail really was about and, and what it was doing to the native people, um, that were here. So certainly, I think as a youth growing up here, didn't get this history. I think it's been as an adult um, where some of these things have, have been learned, but um, as a kid, not so much. And it's interesting because I didn't learn about the Oregon Trail kind of until I played the game in high school. <laughs> and it, if you think about it, it's the same concept, except it's now like a digitized global concept that we all played um, similar to the fourth grade. So it, that, that, that gamifying and that adventure and that erasure um, continued long after, you know, the fourth grade in Oregon. Kind of gave a perception to the, na the nation, right, about what, what the history of Oregon was. Yeah, thank you. Makes you wonder who's in charge of history for curriculum and education. Just a question. So, you know, there's lots of stories. I mean, my family in particular came I'm a first generation mainlander. My my parents are from Hawaii and um, I've got about four generations in Hawaii from Chinese and also native Hawaiian. So kind of interesting. My my Chinese ancestors were enslaved actually and brought to Hawaii as, as um, they called them indentured servants. That's how they got around enslaving them, but they weren't brought here um, voluntarily there. And um, so the history of um, when my parents were came to Oregon, they met in Portland. Uh, there are a lot of laws back then, and that was like in the early 50s. Like they did not allow mixed race marriages in Oregon. They had to go to Vancouver, Washington. So as everybody like put shade on Vancouver, Washington, they at least allowed mixed race marriages back in the 50s. <laughs> um, there are certain places in Portland that they could not live. They're CCNRs and the real estate, you know, they, you know, because they explicitly said Filipino, Japanese, Chinese. Blacks were not allowed to live, and the realtors also steered people away from them. So, I mean, thinking about housing inequity and the things with gentrification and all these sort of things that I've heard you talk about, this history has, you see where we are today, and it continues. I heard you talking about, you know, people in historic neighborhoods and not wanting density. So there's there's some really um, important to understand just the concepts of history and how we got here. So I have a bunch of resources and um, it's really um, helpful. We did this with the staff and it was really good to, for thought provoking. And what does this mean for policy? And what does this mean as we're talking with communities about these sort of things and how do we actually help folks move through change? And so I think that's an important thing, the urban rural issues as well. I really think it's also the government issues from regional government, state government to local government, having worked in all of them and how we engage with our sister agencies, both like at the state level, but also the messaging that goes to the communities. I just looked up climate friendly um, at, you know, things that are going on around those rules. And I, I do call, you know, I, when Gulf 12 came up and communities were fighting against having to put bike parking down. So, I mean, there's a lot of this that, you know, I think DLCD is used to kind of dealing with and communicating. So I think this equity lens will really help. I think it'll help with messaging. Um, and also thinking about evaluation, especially we talked about, I think you're, that there's not a lot of kind of evaluation. Planners do a lot of great stuff, you know, buildable lands inventory, HOA, HNA, housing needs analysis, EOAs, you know, we do all this because we have to. And, um, but there's also some opportunity to be thinking about how do we integrate equity as part of that. So I'm going to get started here, but um, the first one is, um, there's our agenda. So an equity lens, how many people have worked or know about equity lenses? Raise your hand. Oh, good. So, so what are your thoughts about them? What are, how have you used them? You, maybe folks on the online will have next, but have you, how have you seen this used or how have you participated in it? And do you think it's 
been helpful. Yeah. I've just been an observer, um, but I've been aware of it um, coming into use or trying to be used at like local school board level. And for this very reason, you know, we should go about making our decisions and crafting our policies with an equity lens. And so um, I've watched a couple of exercises where they put some language in place and then stopped because they weren't exactly sure how to use it. So I've not seen it implemented. I've just seen it kind of come up to a point and then get stuck. So I'm in all this, I'm very excited about how to actually apply it and implement it so it's real instead of just on paper. Thanks, Brandon. I, well, I had the opportunity um, to serve as liaisons to the climate-friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. So we started with creating the, the equity lens, and then we worked on the rules um, after that through, the, through that lens and continuously checking the lens as we were developing the rules that's great. Thank you. I think most of my experience, probably 90% of it, um, beyond you know the the CFEC implementation or rulemaking, um, has been through academia, where uh now, you know, in today's world where it, it is part of everything we do, everything we talk about has, you know, an equity component where we get a chance to to have, you know, in-depth conversations about what it means to be considering it through an, an equitable lens. Um, and what are the potential inequities of creating certain policies. So that's been really good for me, I know. Um, yeah, just look forward to continue the work now here. Yeah, so to me, it's been mostly through my teaching. I approach it more from a theoretical perspective than a historical one. And uh, But the policy kind of uh, decision-making, I, I think I that's where I wanna learn more, more about it, so. Yeah, and I've seen it in some policymaking spaces, and, and to me, uh, it, you know, it, it can be as simple as asking, you know, one question: what, you know, what, and what is the impact on this group or that group? You know, whatever, however you want to apply the lens, and in staff reports, you know, um, you know, very specifically, just just like a, a fiscal impact lens. Uh, the one thing I, I would I would say, um, and, and this isn't a criticism of the work, but of of uh, I often when we because we use lens a lot, and I often uh, push back to say. Uh, the one thing about a lens is it's, it's actually something that we can put on and then take off, right? And so um, I, I don't know that, I, uh, I think one of the things we ought to look at building is a framework that's built into the work that we do, um, not that just we're using to examine things and then move on. Uh, very often, what I find when, when we talk about equity in places is, great, thank you. All right, let's move on to, the, to make this decision. Let's move on to the next conversation about this, right? rather than having to always constantly bring up, what about equity? What about equity? So if it's a framework that we use, uh, which I actually think the, this de department is moving towards, is very different than, than just putting on our glasses and seeing if this is, if I can read this and then I'm um, being able to take them off and, and move on from there. Thank you. What folks on, on the, the line here? Is there- Yeah, I, I first got, um exposed to this uh, when I was, um, I was actually on the citizen involvement committee for the Portland plan is I think the first time I did that. And they, they brought in um, a um, consultant to talk about equity. And that was the first time I heard it, I remember. And I, I came up, came out of it, like with a very simple way of looking at it is, is when, whenever you do something, who benefits and who is harmed is sort of like um, the general. So I think from there, after that, I've just built on that base uh, in various ways with um, the work that we do here. Uh, I got involved with some equity lens work in uh, in um, elementary schools. You know, thinking about um, my kids' school and and how they're going to move through this kind of process. Um, and uh, obviously now uh, directly related to my work in thinking about specific development projects and how how to think about equity. Uh, in a development project. That's great. All right. Can I say something? Yeah, let's hear. So something that's in interested in me is, so for example, with the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking, different folks are, are making arguments, you know, to further their positions. And a lot of the time I hear equity being kind of thrown around and and used to further, you know, 
different agendas. And so when that happens, I start to think, well, what does that really mean if anybody could just pick up the framework and use it for their own political and financial gain? Oh, that's a good that's a good point. I think of in particular in the work that I've done as a planner on the evaluations, like you said, housing needs analysis, buildable lands inventory, economic opportunities, goal five evaluation, goal seven. A lot of that's qualitative and it is based on, you know, even doing that, you know, I'm really going on here, a Dolan analysis, right? Rough proportionality. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, as long as that you do it. And, and so I think framing this, I think this could be another, you know, just kind of an, an idea for the commission, another thing that could be integrated into the analysis that planners are always doing. When I did the comp plan evaluation in 2012 with the city of Portland, that's what I said. It's like, you've done this before. You do conditional use permits. This is qualitative stuff. You know, it's there are some quantitative components, but it is, it's just like conditional use. What is the benefits? What's the impact? How do we know? How do we mitigate it? So it's, it's something that planners already know how to do. I think what's kind of challenging is that race, racial equity, race in particular, people, it raises all kinds of feels, as you know, and, and it's pretty volatile, but it's it's what it is. And it's it's now a thing. So I think it's it's a good thing that we're in this change. And just to say, I've been working in the last three or four, three years, probably on about seven strategic plans. And, you know, I'm a land use planner. I do a lot of organizational types of work, but everybody now is doing strategic planning the reason why, as you know, the world is so different, you know, and you know, with COVID, the climate, the wildfires, economics, and the racial violence that is going on, um, it is time for people to be doing, thinking about doing things different. There's good foundation, but what may have worked yesterday doesn't work today. And I can share a little bit more about some of the focus groups that I've done for, um, especially folks of color who are traveling in urban areas on, you know, biking and transit and, you know, emerging technology. Um, it's a lot different than it was. So I'm think, rethinking about how we can support and encourage folks, especially in this um, day and age is really important. So really, I see this, like I said, it's a racial equity lens, but, you know, uh, Commissioner Lazo, I think your point is really important that it, it should be integrated and in the kind of work you do. So that's great. You all have some experience. So what I, did, I, I was going to say also speak to um, Commissioner Sandoval. What he said is um, it's it's a process, and it's and it's it's really. Uh, I mean, now we're trying to institutionalize it, but it's really started from a, a source of people who care <laughs> about people who've been harmed you know, um, and, and thinking about the future also. Um, and I think I, I want to concur what, um, and this, this bothered me from yesterday. And I was like, when do I bring this up? <laughs> uh, people using uh, the, the good, good words and works of people who've been in the grassroots movement and thinking about these issues and care about them, people using those words to, it, to further their agenda. And I mean, I think people who are involved in this work know when that's happening, but I, I don't think the general public is going to understand uh, uh, the full extent of that. And so similar, I mentioned this before in, in, in the sustainability movement with greenwashing, you know, we're going to start seeing the starts of equity washing, I would say. And I think it's really uh, responsible for folks that really care about this work to, to speak up, uh, including myself, um, when we see these, these things happening, because um, it's just another way to suppress uh, kind of um, to, to, to continue with the status quo. And we can see what the history of the status quo uh, has resulted in. Yeah, thank you. So um, also I, I kind of use this statistic just to help people understand. I you did this before with like diversity, but I did some recent work with statewide Safe Rest to School. So they work with elementary school and kids on you know safe walking or getting to school. And some of the work we did with some of the analysis, two thirds of the students in rural Oregon are non-white. So if you think about the history or, or the future, even though the people who are kind of in charge right now are making these decisions, we're seeing a big changeover in racial demographics. So, you know, the business case is like, this is our future community and to be able to serve them the best way possible. So, um, 
So what I did was I did search for some national examples and um, especially looking for maybe if there were some statewide equity framework, because, you know, statewide land use planning. And we know that there's a few states that have statewide planning. And um, I'm not exactly sure what's going on in Florida. Maybe some of you <laughs> might have a there one, right? And Hawaii is the other one. And I, I didn't find any references specifically related to racial equity, at least in the, those uh, statewide planning programs. Are there any other states that are doing um, statewide planning in either US? So I was I was wondering if you're making the joke about Florida <laughs> in, reference, in reference. I don't know if you, all of you, are, I follow these things because I'm from Florida. Um, the governor so essentially... Us. Oh, the governor of Florida essentially, I don't know if it's banning or what it is exactly, but like saying we can't teach uh, African-American history in Florida. Um, they, there was an African-American history AP class that, you know, is, it's an actual AP class and they were trying to institute it and in, in, give the option to students to take it and they've like banned it. So <laughs> I didn't know if you were referring to that. <laughs> well, well, I, you know, they do have a statewide planning program. I know, I know that. And so, uh, and I mean, it was kind of tongue in cheek, but. <laughs> yeah, I highly doubt that they're talking about these things. Yeah. So I, I didn't find anything actually statewide, even yeah. from land use planning, and unless any of you are familiar. So what I did was I, I picked a few just for examples. Um, and many of you are familiar with um, Race Forward. And uh, they're also... Governing for racial equity is, is housed under Race Forward. You know, Glenn Harris, who actually was in the mayor's office in Seattle, kind of was doing the, the cutting edge on a lot of these things and helping support, you know, national race racial equity. So they have a, a racial equity uh, toolkit and, you know, they have a number of um, kind of categories and, and steps to go through. Um, and I think I you've got some of my notes is identifying stakeholders, engaging them, identifying racial inequities, examining causes, clarifying purposes, considering adverse impacts, advancing equitable impacts, examining alternatives or improvements, ensuring viability, sustainability, and identifying success indicators. So that's you know a lot of steps in there. And if you want to you look at the racial equity impact assessment, it's, you know, there's there's different words, you know, you talked about framework, lens tool assessments, they seem to be used interchangeably. I mean, I did a lot of looking at how this term is used. Um, the lens can be as um, specific as the tool or framework, or it could be kind of, as you said, just a high level for like one and done sorts of things. So it's really up to the jurisdiction. This isn't, again, an evolving type of um, kind of practice as well. So um, it's really up to you to think about it. So this is perfect because you'll be helping create this. So the other one is uh, City of Seattle. Like I said, they've been cutting edge. They have a um, racial and social justice, justice initiative, which is an ambitious initiative to eliminate racial inequities in communities. And so uh, Kirsten mentioned that there was um, an initiative based on this. You want to share that? Sure, sure. Thanks, Anita. You guys have been talking about it, but it was the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities um, equity framework. And I just want to give a shout out to Matt Crawl on the back, who is a kind of executive sponsor of the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Rules, and Evan Manvel, who who um, led that six-page equity lens specific to that pro project. So um, Stephen Lee, who was with the governor's office at the time, actually worked with this mayor to develop this equity sort of just environmental justice, is environmental justice framework. Um, but Jim immediately loved it, I think, because it's the, you know, the accessibility of the steps. And so we use it as a back, back, backbone for writing those rules that um, basically say, hey, use data to look in your communities at where communities in your specific community regulated by the rules about where they're underserved populations based on transportation improvements and other things compared to demographic data. Have a conversation in that community. Don't just decide for them and then come up, help that avoid your investment strategy. So this, this example directly informed our rules. So we're grateful for City of Seattle and the others who the precedent work in this area and also to Matt and his team for their leadership in this. We will bring this to all staff to kind of unpack how it was used and how it worked here because the climate team knows it well and is kind of off onto other things, but it was really the first time our agency used an equity lens for um, rule in rulemaking. And then um, it continues to inform how we ask local governments to do the work. So it, it's useful to use a case study. Thanks for the reminder, Anita. Yeah. And then um, Deputy Director, remind me, I felt like when that was going on, um, the statement that came out at the beginning of that work 
was really guided and led by a lot of the folks that were in the rules advisory committee too. the diverse right. group of, of, uh, and there was debates over words and should this be included or not? And I, I remember chiming in and saying, I think that's going too far, you know, like, how are we going to measure that? So it was a very robust with external people uh, working on it. That's right. We even had, we had, to, we were, we were, so lost in the weeds, we had to go see Dr. Sandoval in office hours and help him help us out. But we were all hung up on terms and what to use and using different terms. There was, you know, community advisory committee members, RAC members who said, look, you know, you're calling this underserved, underutilized, marginalized. She's like, I'm just trying to do good work in the world. And none of these words relate to me. So that's where we came up with the term taking a page in the Oregon Health Authority of Priority Populations, which we use and still continue to use in programmatic ways in the agency, like who to define which populations have been underserved. Um, but we we flip back in the rules to just say under, I think it was underserved or historically marginalized. I can't remember, but it's what's also used in the federal government's executive order on the Biden administration. So trying to align our our terms with the federal government. Thanks, Dr. Sandoval, for your consultation on that. On that. That's great. Thank you. Can I make a, a comment on that yeah. on that piece as it moves forward? Uh, and I think one thing that would be interesting to, to, to see is what what the impact of using that um, framework had on actual outcomes. Right. So one of them could be we changed some words, but what we're really curious about is um, did it actually change the conversation and the outcome of the rulemaking itself? Right, it's not not just the words got changed. Because uh, one of the things I'll say is in that in the housing rulemaking we did, it was sort of interesting on the first day to kind of go around this table in this room and hear why folks were in the room. And so many of them talked about the, the racial equity aspects of it. And then as we proceeded through the next year of meetings, um, it seems like we'd lost a lot of that focus, right? And then and then nothing, you know, so at times I'd remind us that, you remember that first day when we taught, when so many of you said um, you, you were here because of racial equity and now what you are saying um, actually doesn't fit that framework. So are you willing to come off of that stance based on that? And the answer generally was no, or it was uh, yes, but we're, we're going to disregard that. So. Commissioner, as, as if I may share, as good planners, we could flood you with paperwork on this, but um, Evan also did a crosswalk of how the lens informed the rules. And that is on the website. It's it. I, I do think this is an example. We, the staff and Matt and his team should be proud of the follow through on this one, because we did then use use that equity lens to mat, to go through the rules and see if we said what we said we were going to do, did what we said we were going to do. But I think the 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 real proof, I think, is going to be on the ground and do the investments look differently in five or 10 years. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think measurement is, is one that I think is important um, as you talked about evaluation and then improvement. So, so I looked at a couple other national lenses. I didn't put them up, but I just wanted to share. One of them was Montgomery County, uh, Maryland Planning Department. And what's interesting about that is how they do their projects and planning. I see nodding. Um, the OJ's guidance for the um, racial impact analysis actually cites uh, Montgomery County. So, mm -hmm. you know, what it should be and what it should look like. And, you know, I followed. And so they use that as an example on, on racial impact and also rulemaking that y'all are having to do these days. Um, Anita, you're, if I may chair that, that what you just mentioned was our, our state of Oregon Department of yes. Justice guidance on the new rule, racial equity yes. impact statement. So thank you. Some of these things fly by so fast that we don't even know what our state is doing sometimes, but we do have a, a law that required um, racial impact statements on rules and um, Steve's Department of Justice. Yeah. Our agency asked to be a party to the advisory on that because no one knew what it meant. I don't know if, if Steve has anything else to add on that. No, just uh, every agency was confronted with how do you uh, proceed with this? So uh, several agencies posed the question to DOJ and DOJ came up with a, a kind of a model guideline and it did look to um, some existing products out there that were in use and had a little bit more history. Uh, so, you know, a sense of how workable they would be. This is a little more that, history. 2020 is like when they started. So yes, go ahead. Is, is that easy to find online? We, we can start it for it. Thank you. Some of the other ones, National APA um, mm -hmm. issued a policy guide in 2019 and planning for equity and um, just kind of a policy development and evaluation. And it's got 11 cross-cutting equity issues, gentrification, environmental justice, community engagement and empowerment, climate change and resilience, education, energy, resource consumption, health equity, heritage preservation, mobility and transportation, and public spaces and places. 
So it's a big, you know, APA national policy kind of guidance, at least for um, from national APA that's got some, you know, more detail on maybe for jurisdictions or folks who want to go through that. Um, it seems fairly comprehensive in that framework it doesn't actually say helps you understand how to do implementation of that, but it's a good start. Um, the last one I saw was the um, social equity toolkit, which is from the Connecticut Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. So really providing guidance for municipalities in Connecticut, and they provided this social equity toolkit. And um, interesting, there's just kind of a fun sort of way to think about it in a real basic way. And it was like, build trust, right? We heard that. Get the facts, listen, lead, change, provide training, and prioritize accountability. So those are pretty simple. They seem, you know, it's just like how we want to do our planning work anyway, right? And so this is just a way to look at, especially as they call it social equity, but it's also racial equity. So then I did some review of, um, and you some have these in your packet of some mm -hmm. uh, local government equity lens examples. So Multnomah County's uh, equity empowerment lens, Metro's equity framework, um, one that I worked on was the Regional Habitat Connectivity Working Group. So um, real real simple, real quick here is the, um, I kind of like Multnomah County's um, focus, which is um, people, place, process, and power and how decisions and issues are made. I'm not going to read all of that, but it's it goes through that in a really kind of nice way of organizing, thinking of your thoughts. Understanding the county in particular is focused on public health mostly and also community safety and federal outcomes and things like that. So they do a lot of measurement um, as well on a number of things. Um, this was done in 2014 by Sonali Balaji. Um, the research that I've done is I haven't seen this updated or actually what the outcomes have been. They do have an Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion that actually are helping, you know, do a number of things such as trainings and resource, but I have not seen um, this equity empowerment lens, what that looks like institutionally and how it's been implemented and what the outcomes are, but it's some really good um, theoretical work and really good cutting edge work. Anybody familiar with this? Have they heard of the counties. This is some real interesting work. The next one here is one that um, I also worked on early on, I think in, in 2014, 2015, um, Metro decided to focus on racial equity. And so I helped them do some, the interesting way they did it too, was actually kind of a top down. It was not necessarily community led. So it was, it was led by staff and um, they um, hired me as a consultant to do focus groups to talk about equity, what does Metro do? Um, and so we did some help facilitate some questions, probably like three rounds over a period of time as they kind of created their equity framework in 2015 and 16 and came back to these focus groups. These focus groups are mostly, I think Kirsten, you might've worked on that with me too. We did community-based or culturally-based organizations. So we in the Portland metro area. And then we had some subject matter experts on like transportation, parks and nature, and maybe it was solid waste. Those are the things that Metro has. And um, so definitely the conversations are really different on, on a lot of these, but it really helped inform their equity framework. And like I said, top down, so staff led all this, they brought it to their Metro council and said, we are gonna lead with race. This is the framework we wanna do. And they adopted it. And so, after that was the implementation, they had um, every department had to create a uh, equity action plan, racial equity action plan using this framework. And um, they hired me also to help facilitate with some of these departments. And that was where it was very difficult because it was created kind of from top down. A lot of the staff had no idea what, what it was and why they would have to do it or if it was part of their work. So it was there was a lot of there was a lot of pushback and a lot of conflict. And, they, and here we are, 2022, 20, 23, they're still working. I'm working with Metro. They hired me to help them with their regional travel options to do an equity kind of framework in their workplace. But it's, it's some hard work, especially because, you know, they did pass a resolution to do it. So that's the reason. But, you know, as far as creating the framework and the definitions has been really challenging with even though Metro is a fairly large organization. Um, they have made a lot of progress, I think, in looking at the diversity of their uh, advisory uh, councils. Um, they, they offer stipends and pretty good stipends for participants on evaluation. Um, they really do a, build it into their grant making as well because they do have, you know, um, 
construction size tax grants that they give out and equity has to be part of the grants that they give out. So I've seen some good, really good progress. There's some that as, you know, Metro as a regional government, people love them or hate them because of the <laughs> oversight over what 26 cities. So can you imagine in three counties how different they are and having oversight from a regional government, understanding people think that's a great idea, but trying to do that is very, very difficult, but um, it's been pretty good work. They still are working on it. It's, and as far as the outcomes, um, I've seen a dashboard and they've just started reporting their outcomes in 20, it was 2020 and then COVID hit. So I haven't seen anything beyond that from one year of reporting back. And so you can see that this is kind of a long-term type of work for at least Metro. Anita, can I ask you something? About yeah. That? Can, can you characterize why you think it was, uh, it was why things were difficult at Metro? Well, I think because it was top down. Okay. I mean, that was a question I had. I'm, you know, I'm a planner and we like to be collaborative in everything we do. And you know how it is, it kind of gets all messed up. But I think because there was no probably statewide mandate or federal mandate, and mm -hmm. it was just coming from Metro as an initiative, I think they just felt like if it came from the top down and they created this framework, everybody would have to go along. So, you know, they hired me to help facilitate with their staff. Yeah. And I said, okay, just think about like, remember when we had to do ADA, right? Yeah. It was kind of like, we didn't know what we have to do, but we had to make these accommodations. You know, if you remember that, we had to like put in curb, curb ramps and curb cuts and people were not happy about those sort of things. Um, but same sort of thing. This is how you, this is part of the work you do. And, you know, you don't have to like it. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, why do you do your job? Why do you get up every day? And, and um, this is just part of evolving understanding of, you know, how government works. So that was kind of the messaging that I worked. Some well, people liked it and didn't like it, but. And, and that's think because, that was a I was going to say that okay. speaks to the diversity of the group that's being hurt, you know, because I'm sure there's members there that have wanted this type of work for a very long time. And, you know, if the, I'm not saying there, because I don't know what's happening there, but I'm saying in another setting, um, uh, I wonder how valued those other voices, you know, more diverse voices feel, you know, to hear their colleagues saying, why do we have to do this? What's the purpose? Or, you know, <laughs> what's the importance? You can imagine being a person of color in that setting, just being like, wow, <laughs> because that's your lived daily experience that you don't have a choice on, um, where some people have a choice where they don't have to think about these things or not. So I think the more diversity we have in these professions, the more that people understand, like, Hey, my this is my colleague's lived experience, and I've I value that, right? And I I want to address that. Yeah, thank you. It really does depend on the culture of the organization you're in and the racial makeup and leadership as well. So I think that's part of it. I do I did hold a couple um, kind of people of color um, focus groups of staff, and they weren't necessarily in any positions of power, and so there was and there was a small group and dispersed. So it was it was challenging for the staff there, like like uh Annalie said, to hear this from other people and they were didn't feel comfortable speaking up. So thank you. Yeah. And that's sort of the assumption I was working from too. So thank you. Yeah. Um chair also for bringing that perspective forward. So here's another one um I was asked to do that I recently completed and I think I just had a copy of just the equity lens, but we were hired by the um, Regional Habitat Connectivity Working Group. So this is in the metro region, and it's made up of um, governments, parks, districts, trail organizations, um, wildlife like Audubon um, and other folks who are were really interested in looking at habitat connectivity region wide, of the importance of you know pathways and stream corridors and things like that. And so they created a strategic action plan, and a lot of it was real scientific and how to evaluate you know conservation values on. Um, and looking at areas that should that should be preserved for conservation and areas that um, are should be um, restored. And they did have a, a, a JEDI, they called it Justice, uh, mm -hmm. Equity, Diversion, Diversity and Inclusion Statement. But they um, had us come in and help them kind of refine that and create an equity lens. So that was um, interesting as well, as you probably know, and I'll talk a little bit more about scientists and environment and equity and what does that mean? There's still a lot of controversy over that, that, you know, we're scientists, there should be nothing to do with equity because it's science. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's not, we're talking about conservation where, you know, so having that conversation with this group and they were, you know, not, they were not jurisdictionally ordered to do anything together. They were, they were kind of 
together because they really had a commitment to this connectivity. But it was really good conversation about how how to look at restoration, how to value that. We actually did some work with some GIS for um, community vulnerability index that we created and we overlaid the um, habitat cognitivity both for conservation and restoration to help them prioritize, especially with an equity lens on that. So that was really great. Um, we came up with kind of a, eight questions as well on some of the equity lens that you probably have in there. And same sort of thing, historical inequities, benefits and burdens, decision-making process, data, um, restorative justice process, we'll talk a little more about that, and then accountability. So you can see that's a lot of similar types of, um, you know, components in equity lenses, and it's similar in other sorts of things. Some other equity lenses also that I, you know, um, reviewed, um, not going to highlight too much, was again, the City of Portland Comp Plan that you have a copy of that I did. Um, in particular, Oregon, because of the, the previous uh, gov governor, there's a lot of equity focus. So the Oregon Higher Education Coordinating Committee, the HEC, has a nice equity lens. They have actually an equity um, staff person that help create it. So they're doing big work. Of course, it's mm -hmm. education. So outcomes are super important and understanding racial inequities. So you can see why they're further ahead on a number of things. Um, how Oregon Housing and Community Services has a nice um, equity toolkit, if you've seen that. And then also the Oregon Investment Board. So then you do have some sister agencies that have some good framework that you have a couple copies in there. So um, next we're going to have an update of the DLCD DEI work plan by Kirsten. Oh, goodness. Yes, you. <laughs> yeah, she got there. <laughs> Thank you. So it's um, just a little update. There's five tasks um, in our work plan, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work plan. Um, Casaria Taylor and Sadie Carney co-chair this committee, and we're grateful for the work. So just putting it somewhere I can actually see, since my eyeballs can't stretch that far to the screen. But there's um, the five tasks um, in our work plan, and these are on our website. Our search advocacy. So that was um, kind of taking sorry, up. Sorry a, to interrupt, Deputy. Yeah. Could you? Yeah. Um, we have the strategic plan where we have some some things around DEI and the strategic plan. How does that relate to this? I'm just trying to ground myself. Thank you. Really, really good um, question. So this one was um, sort of accepted by our director in January of 2021. Um, so, so this is an internal sort of DEI work plan by the committee. And it predated our work on our agency eight-year strategic plan. So this, you can think of this as sort of a early piece, a stopgap. So the, this is going back in time a little bit. So January 2021, I know it doesn't seem so long ago, but this is the two-year work plan that was developed by the DEI committee before we'd even started the strategic plan. So they had recommended some search advocacies um, strategies, which are... Um, to recruit and retain a more diverse workforce. Those um, are also picked up in our strategic plan. I'll do, I'll, I'll mention each of these with the relationship if they are ongoing to the, with, to the current, to the <laughs> draft strategic plan. The second one is guidance for rulemaking um, to diversify rules advisory committees, both in thought and practice and geography. Um, that is underway. Kasari has a really, really good, you know, kind of working draft on that. She shares with any group that's um, initiating rules advisory committee work. Um, so we'll be bringing you a draft charge and charter for the goal five work with the um, sovereign tribes of Oregon later in the year. And so we're, we're using that um, Kasari's guidebook there. Third one is to offer staff training on the D DEI core concepts. I touched on that earlier. That is complete. Um, for what is DEI as it pertains to land use, uh, implicit bias and microaggressions. And actually, Chair Halova, one of the first meetings when I was on as deputy and you were on, we, you were talking about the annual training on, I think, diversity, equity, inclusion, or required course that um, all state agency employees were required to take. And you said, well, what about doing something for the department that's specific to land use? So we're finally doing what you asked us to do um, about three no. years ago. I, I I see I see you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So the and the fourth one is presenting information at all staff meetings from various divisions on how their work is incorporating DEI. That's ongoing, and then finally to develop a short research guide on Oregon's history of racism as it pertains to the land use planning program. No one has has um I think that was a glimmer in Evan Manville's eyes, who was the first chair of the DEI committee internally, and I don't think anyone's gotten to that yet. 
I would just note that Jenna Hughes, who's one of your appointed CIEC members, has written an extremely important book on the racist history of planning in Portland, which is a little bit of a snapshot as to you could just take it kind of throughout Oregon. Um, but that um, we might just sort of excerpt from that and and might write a short piece on um, our, our agency's website as we implement the 50 going into the next 50 years of land use planning program. So those are five important pieces that are currently sort of either complete or underway and ongoing into the future. Thanks, Anita. Yeah, I'd like to point out Jenna Hughes is a colleague of mine. So she's actually done APA panels on Beaverton's racist history too. So really good research. And then she and I worked on one for um, Urban Land Institute Northwest. We did uh, some equity trainings for leadership for change. And so she did one for Oregon and Washington related to real estate and land use. So She's um, a wealth of information and just a really great person that has a good lens on understanding how that works, especially the history. So got her on the on the committee. You know, she's she's really, um, really awesome. I, sorry to keep chiming in. But uh, and the one thing I would say about that work is I, I don't know that it's enough to point out the, the what the history is here in Oregon. The, the task is actually what was um the department's specific role in that history. And, and I don't think it would be hard to look at, you know, there must have been in the early part of planning, um, very specific rules about who could be where, what could be where that, that were really rooted in um, racism. And so it, it is specific to the work of the entity that's being evaluated, City of Portland, City of Beaverton, those those places that you mentioned Jenna's done work in. Yeah. And I work with Jenna on that. You know, and Alan, I think, you know, if you're talking about 50 years of land use planning, that is a big piece of it too, yeah. right? So I don't know if you mentioned that, but just yeah, guidance, talking. thank you. Wow, oh, that's great. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about an equities lens framework. Um, the way I've kind of seen this is that uh, the framework comes from the state of Oregon's equity framework, which came from the COVID-19 response from uh, the governor's office. So you do have a framework here of state equity values and what the framework looks like. You've probably seen this before. Um, more recently, you may have seen a copy of the State of Oregon Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Action Plan, which really builds on the framework. And it's a really good piece of work. You've probably seen this before. Um, it goes really deep and is really bold um, from what I've seen. And so I'm really thrilled that you have something already to build on. Um, so as part of that, it's equity lens elements, vision, definitions, and categories. I put them in these three buckets. This is just how I organize um, the way I'm doing because we're all equity lens is whatever you want, we want to make it. But there is a racial equity vision already. Again, this is from the DEI action plan you may have seen. Um, I'm not going to read all that because you've probably seen this before. But again, this is something you have already to build on. You also have a whole bunch of definitions. You were talking about this and that, but this is great. This is the state already has this. And these are some pretty bold definitions. If you can see, you know, anti-racism, colonialism, um, anti-black racism. So, I mean, these are pretty, pretty bold definitions and it's really, really good for you to um, build on these. So I would suggest you um, adopt all of these into your kind of equity lens or strategic plan since you do have the state there. You can also look at some of the other state agencies' equity plans too, because they have different um, definitions. They may have done those before this came out. So um, I'm not sure if they're going to be updating it, but you do have the advantage of when looking at some other ones that have been done and now having this. So really what we're gonna do for our exercise today is I have come up with eight proposed categories just from looking at all the lenses and examples. Um, you're, you're more than welcome to either change those or recommend different ones, um, but we're gonna try to try to organize ourselves for this kind of workshopping that we're gonna do under these eight um, categories. And so they are historical inequities, benefits and burdens, data justice, community engagement and empowerment, decision-making, restorative justice, accountability, and then measuring and evaluating outcomes and continuous improvement. So what I'd like to do is like, there are some terms that I kind of want to go through if folks want to, you know, are familiar or not with them, but just again to ground us. So as you know, data justice is an approach that redresses ways of collecting and disseminating data that is has invisibilized and harmed historically marginalized communities 
for decades, if not centuries. Data has been weaponized against um, communities of color in particular to reinforce oppressive systems that result in disinvestment and often inappropriate harmful policies. And this comes from the coalition of communities of color who helped um, the state with some of the data justice um, work that they've done. So it, it, data justice aims to capture forms of knowledge and lived experience that are community centered and community driven. Um, to make visible community-driven needs, challenges, and strength, and be representative of a community, and treat data in ways that promote community self-determination. So really, a lot of this is working with the community to talk about how the data is going to be used, even uh, helping them frame the research and how that's going to be done, and also the outcomes, which is a whole different way of uh, way we've kind of done a lot of things. An example is on here is uh, for data justice, and this is pertaining to the Oregon Health Authority, but that is the name of this House Bill, 3159, and it shows you really, it's mostly having to do with collecting data, and the newest one, they call it SOGI, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. This came through COVID and understanding the impact of COVID disproportionately, not only on um, SOGI categories, but they also talk about, um, they call it Real D, Race, Ethnicity, um, language data, is that what, R -E -A -L -D. so a lot of those are intersectionality and it, it, it's important, especially from a health standpoint, but also um, planning is public health as well on what the outcomes are and what investments go in and how policies affect that. So there already are some great things again, going at the state of Oregon on data collection and how to do that. And um, I think definitely looking at some coordination on using and sharing that kind of data um, as you look at how you want to look at outcomes is important. And then we also have, um, here's some pointed out data equity, which is a working definition. Um, so the state of Oregon's chief data officer has been developing a distinction between data justice defined by community and data equity, which is the state agency's responsibility. So, there's this information. Uh, anything else you want to add to that? Well, I think this is just a really nascent area for us. And I just want to acknowledge that the states are at the beginning stages of this. And it actually just took a pop. It's all our rings. We all have the same ring. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all get triggered. But the, um, the uh, so data, like Anita said, data, Catherine Helms, our state chief data officer, that data justice, we should let community define that. What is justice? But our responsibility is to data equity, which just means that um, we're looking to engage under, um, under engaged, normally not engaged community members in the development of um, equity and then equity information, then data inf and information, and then also make sure that folks have access to it. So this work was paused. Um, while the state develops a, um, a um, the map, um, what is that <laughs> sort of a wildfire map? Excuse me, the wildfire map. No, no. Uh, that one has passed map. too. <laughs> but this th this yeah. one has this one hasn't even been started oh. yet. This is on um, I think ethnic vul vulnerable populations. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, and so that's a statewide map. But please just stay tuned in terms of data equity. It's something that we mentioned in our strategic plan, but we, we I think we need to define it for ourselves, mm -hmm. um, making sure that folks have the access to information um, and also are involved in the development of the information. So just moving along, I know that just quick time check, we have just 45 minutes before we promised commissioners they could get to the other side of the mountains. Um, mm -hmm. But Anita, thank Maybe you for the opportunity to speak on that one. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Oh, so I was gonna, sorry to take more time. No, go ahead. I, I, I was, ex I'm happy to see how deep it is, this conversation, like the, the definition. But it's funny because sometimes it's just having the data period, regardless of who made it, and then continuing with the data. Like a lot of times these data collections are made specifically like black community metrics, and then it's dropped. And then five years later, it's resurfaced. And because it wasn't continued, continually staying in the conversation there were no there was no there's no accountability for it you know mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you right i mean this honestly the coalition of communities of color partnered with portland state university and probably oh, i don't know 2008 2009 to develop the unsettling profile series i don't know if folks remember that but it was very it was just from multnomah county but it's striking to watch and see, you know, communities of color know this, this is lived experience, but for, you know, privileged white academic like me planner, 
like, oh my gosh, my fellow Oregonians, this is just not fair. So I think putting the data out in front can really help us tell the story in graphic and quick ways. So we just haven't, planners have not traditionally done that. Um, folks in, in public affairs actually do it a little bit more, I think, but planners have a long way to go. Thanks. So another term is restorative justice. Now this is out of the DEI action plan, which is great. This is a, a big term that some people don't actually want to talk about. So, you know, the theory of justice that emphasizes repairing harm by having the parties decide together in order to um, cause fundamental change in people, relationships and communities. And I can say structures and policies since we're talking about that. So I think that's really great. You have that to lean on. Um, so I put a number of like examples they are not the best, but some of them you're familiar with community benefits agreements. You've heard talk for years about that. I have not seen many of those come out in a implementation manner. I've worked on a couple when I was up in Portland. You may have some other examples, but meaning that the community helps needs to help to decide what those benefits are. So it's a pretty time consuming and timely and um, I know that there had been some that were um, set up in Portland, but then the project never happened. So the, the benefit of the kind of investment didn't happen. So that was one example. I put mitigation, which is not necessarily restorative justice, but it's a term people kind of understand, you know, wetland mitigation banks and things like that, which is not necessarily restorative, but it's more of like trading something for something else. But um, land banking, a lot of you are familiar with that. That is happening, but not as much as um, it could. I, I know I'd worked on um, up in Portland on the Southwest Corridor, which is a transit project looking at ways to land bank, um, like pieces and parts of um, acquired land for the corridor. Ellen, you probably were part of that as well, which was pretty innovative because yeah. that's never happened, which almost seems like a no brainer, but <laughs> it was. And then there's some, some other ones that are kind of cutting edge and I'll talk a little bit more about is a traditional ecological knowledge, uh, land back movement and reparations. So um, let's see, I thought I had some definite, oh no, shoot. Oh, I didn't have, I did have some definitions about that. But it's just the slide deck didn't make it in. So what I wanted to talk about was a traditional ecological yeah. knowledge. Has anyone heard of that before? Yes. So Stuart, what do you know about it? You wanna share? You don't have to. Sure. Um, most of uh, the traditional eco ecological knowledge that I work with currently is through wildfire planning um, and really trying to bring back, you know, our, our relationship with fire into a healthy world through using fire. Um, and also, I mean, it really, for me, it's, it's, it's changing that relationship to fire. Um, that's so crucial. It's not only the use of it, but, you know, right now we're so afraid of fire and rightfully so. But that's because we've had this relationship with fire so long that's been, you know, uh, so negatively perceived. Whereas if we can change our uh, our perception of what wildfire is, especially, uh, we can change the way we deal with it um, because we can look at it through a different lens, which is, you know, more similar to how traditional uh, indigenous, you know, yeah. peoples live with fire here. Yeah, thank you. I think what I've seen though too, this is great because it is it's indigenous knowledge. Um, and, you know, like you said, wildfire, prescribed burning, um, a number of things. And now it's into public land management, working with tribes as well. Um, the pushback that I've seen, and I had mentioned like with the regional habitat connectivity, the scientists say we don't have enough data, you know, even though there's thousands of years of land management practices, you know, science is new in comparison, but in order to talk about conservation and, you know, credits and all those sort of things, it's, there's been some pushback on that because they can't necessarily quantify it. There's also been some other controversy related to, now this is traditional uh, indigenous knowledge. And so if it has been used by someone other than them, do they need permission, especially if it's, you know, not only land and water management, but other sorts of things and who actually should be doing that? Should the tribes be brought in? So this, even though it's cutting edge, it's still um, a lot of discussion that it needs to happen as well. Um, if this one could actually be as part of a goal five analysis, right? EC analysis, it's a different way of thinking about it. So I think that's a really great opportunity. The other one is a land back movement. Anyone heard of land back movement as well? Yeah, Alan, do you want to, anything you know about it? Uh, oh, I think when I think of it, it's traditionally of um, movements to, to restore what are native or indigenous lands back to those communities. Uh, actually, in, uh, there was actually an interesting example in, 
California of a, a black family, the Bruce's Beach, where uh, a, a piece of property that was taken on the California coastline from a, a black family was uh, returned to that family. Um, uh, it was taken through eminent domain and then it was turned to that black family and then the black family actually sold it back to LA County for $20 million. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. So the press. Yeah. 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 You have an example? Well, no, I just had read that article. Oh, yeah, just in that's the last great. couple of weeks, it was a, yeah. Yeah, another yeah, example. My, I was gonna say my company's involved with two of those type of projects. One is a, a, a site in uh, North Portland um, that a hospital and a redevelopment authority um, took um, in an eminent domain from the black community. And so uh, giving, uh, returning the land back uh, to the community with priorities around black community issues. And then I have another one I'm just starting that's um, about uh, creating a, um, uh, a uh, artist and residency and community gathering space um, for black and indigenous artists. And then the idea behind it is to, to give it back at the end when it's stabilized uh, to native, the native American community. That's awesome, thank you. So there are examples here locally and also nationally. I think another one was uh, California Governor Newsom um, wanted to spend money um, to help indigenous communities. He um, allocated $100 million to nearly 200 tribes to conserve with a goal to preserve 30% of the state's land and waters by 2030 for helping with water and land conservation. Um, so that's good. Another one is reparations. Some of these are kind of land back reparations as well. Um, in particular, examples are um, Japanese Americans that were incarcerated during World War II actually were under the 1988 Civil Liberties Act, were um, given $20,000 for being incarcerated during World War II. The Native American uh, 1946 Claims Commission allocated 1.3 billion to 176 tribes for lands taken, which only amounted to about $1,000 per person um, for lost land. Native Hawaiian Homes Act of 1920, folks who are 50% Hawaiian, if you understand um, my family's from Hawaii, Hawaiian was a sovereign nation, so it was not ownership was kind of through the monarchy. And then when the government overthrew the government of the Hawaii's um, system, it was all state land. And so people didn't own land back in the day. So, or even now my uncle would lived on leased land for a long time and then was finally able to purchase his home. So um, anyway, yet to be reparations um, for African-American and black slavery. And we're hoping to see that. It sounds like uh, Commissioner Hollowo is doing some really great work. So I'd like to thank you for that. So what we're gonna do, we have, oh good, it's 10 after. So we're gonna take about 20 minutes I know it's not enough time, but what I have is, again, these categories here. And what I'm going to have you do, you have copies of these different equity lenses, which have some of similar categories. What I want you to do to be thinking about, this is going to be a little sticky note um, exercise, is to write some of the questions or maybe what sort of data and information that you think we should have be taking um, under each of those categories. So that's why I gave you that handout because there's some really good questions and how they fit under these categories. And while you write them down and then I want you to walk up and put them under the sticky on the on the sheets over there in the back of the room. If you think there's a better title too, feel free to crop that out and you know give that a new title. So I'm gonna give you about 20 was minutes. There, for us on the Zoom, was there something sent to us or? Sorry. You should have um, the handout that says examples of um, equity lands. So the, the first page is the City of Portland Draft Comprehensive Plan Equity Evaluation. And it's about five sheets. It's got City of Portland. It's got Metro. It's got the Regional Habitat Connectivity. It's got the Equity Empowerment Lens. And then I put in the Oregon Tech Equity Lens Guiding Questions. So there are a lot so, of similar ones. Did, does other. anybody know who sent that to us? Kirsten will, Kirsten send, will send that to you right away. Okay. Okay. And then if you want to talk among yourselves or write down under each of those categories some questions or different categories, this will help us really frame up what this lens could look like as we do it. Any questions before we get started? Do folks have like five minutes just to think about it? Yeah. 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 So we're, we're writing questions on our sticky notes and then put on the right. Some of the questions that are within this lens framework. I mean, if there's actually like statements of like. The idea is when you do a lens, it's like a question or something that you're going to have to do to evaluate, like a policy or something like that. So if it's Sorry. not a question, it could be a directive. It's like, you know, do this, you know, look at historical equities and use this data. So if you even have 
data source ideas and what they should be collecting or looking at. This is kind of wide open because we're creating, even though you've got a lot of really great frameworks here. Does that make sense? Sorry, could you say the assignment once again? <laughs> assignment. So we've got these eight categories. Okay, you got it. There. Probably yeah. difficult for these guys because they don't have sticky pads. Right. Yeah. So what, trying to what, what you can do is just write them down or you can talk amongst each other and take notes. But you also have those copies of the questions from these other equity lenses. So this is to kind of give you you can copy them down and decide which ones you think are more relevant to the work that you all do. And then um, we're going to place those under each of those categories. Some of the questions might be repeated in some of the categories. Yeah, there are right? probably a lot of them are exactly oh. the same. That's kind of why these headings look real familiar, because that's kind of how I've decided to help organize this. And if you think there's a better way, I'm open to that as well. Yeah, but the questions might get repeated in, in the yeah, categories. They yeah, they could be repeated in those too, yeah. You should also note for the folks online that they're going to miss the dance party right. to this exercise. Unfortunately. That's your loss. And let me know if you have any questions as you start kind of noodling through here. This is sort of the important ingredients, right?
Okay. Are they unmuted now? Okay. Trehalova and Commissioner Jacobson, if you want to just email me, if you'd like, um, we can write them up for you, or you could say them and we could write them on sticky notes either way. Anything you feel is important for the equity lens, a potential equity lens for DLCD. LCDC, forgive me. Uh, we, I just came back on. So could you say, and both of us just came back on, could you say whatever you said again? Sure. If you, so we're just thinking of a way to collect your guidance here. So if you'd like to say them out loud for us, we can write them on sticky notes and stick them on the wall. What you, elements you think are important for an equity lens for LCDC, or you could email me and I could jot them on to um, sticky notes and put them up on the, on the wall for you. We did not make it through all the categories. We had a no little pressure, talk, but, no pressure. But um, one of the things we did talk about is uh, just that we feel like data equity and data justice is not something that maybe is talked about enough um, or understood enough. And, you know, most decisions are made with some kind of data. Um, and it's usually that best available data. And sometimes that best available data just isn't very good. Um, I was kind of talking about the example I gave um, yesterday about the homeless declaration being based on a point in time count. Rural communities don't aren't given enough resources to do an adequate point in time count. And then that's the data set that's used to get the money. Um, and there's just lots. Emily had several other examples um, as well. And so there's just lots of examples of how, you know, bad data just further enhances existing inequities. Thank you. My my example in the same data world is, um, you know, home ownership is a path to uh, wealth creation for most of Middle America, and you know, there's sy systemic inequities about about fun, very very <laughs> intentional um, trying to have people of color not own homes, right? And so in our state, uh, there's not a lot of money put toward home ownership. Hence, there's not a lot of organizations that. Uh, advocate and lobby for home ownership money. Hence, there's no money for home ownership. <laughs> so it's like a circle. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's somewhere where it's like the data shows the, the the people on the ground want, but because of the the money and the power situation, um, it doesn't it it doesn't get addressed. Thank you. much focused on the data equity, data justice part. Okay, I'm giving you a one minute countdown. Time I was like, hopefully we did the assignment correctly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, didn't know, we didn't know what we were doing. The same thing. <laughs> Let's see. I asked me the right questions. Okay, while everybody else finishes their homework. Um, I was wondering, uh, Anita, if you had heard of, I'm just looking up here, Design for the Just City. And it's called the, uh, the Just City Lab. It's out of Harvard Graduate School of Design. I have not. I've heard about Design Justice. And design yeah, is <laughs> yeah, which I know more sure. radical, I think, than Harvard, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to deny um, one of the things I liked. I heard the, the woman that leads that group uh, talk at the Black and Design Conference at Harvard. And uh, what I loved about what they're doing is they they have this kind of map of words. And let me tell you real quickly, like acceptance, aspiration, choice, democracy, engagement fairness, identity, you know, just really big words that people might say, yeah, we want that. But then they break down each one of those words into like seven or 10 small words that could fit under there. So like when you say rights, do you mean freedom? Do you mean knowledge? Do you mean ownership when you say rights? And so it's just like, I, it really impressed on me as like a vocab, like a universal vocabulary to actually get down to when a community says, what, what are you, what are you actually saying when you say this? So I thought it would be good uh, resource to to throw in. I've been I, I've wanted to try to get uh, the professor that runs that to come to Oregon and talk about it. 
um, but it, it'd be nice to kind of investigate that more. I would love that, um, Mr. Halliba. Um, what was it, Harvard? What was it again? Design is city design. The website is design for the just city dot org. Design for the just city dot org, and they have this like big map, like I said, with these keywords and then smaller words and then definitions for the words underneath them. Yeah, that would be really great for um, community engagement. <laughs> as we hear yeah. for me in particular, when people talk about certain things, it's within their personal or cultural context. And so um, I, I like how to think about like breaking that down and what does that mean? So yeah, really and I'll helpful. give you another example. Power. Do you mean representation? Do you mean empowerment? Do you need, mean agency? Right. And so on and so forth. Yeah, it was in the context of when you talk to community, like mm -hmm. understanding what they're actually asking for. Exactly. All right, commission, let's get your sticky notes up there and we're gonna probably circle up to the um, flip charts um, for a little bit of a discussion and walkthrough. So let's meet up there in just a couple, yeah, just a couple of moments. Thank you. I got dropped there for a second, had to log back in, so I'm not sure what is happening. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Commissioner Jacobson, uh, commissioners in the room are just putting their flip sticky notes on the wall. Oh, got it. Thank you. It was like people were yeah. talking. I froze. I logged back in and everyone was gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so sorry. Technology. Is, okay. It gets right, tired okay. too. All right. <laughs> Zoom needs a nap. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> So they're taking a little walk and they're taking one that any of them that actually you think are really good ones, they could not buy it. Just because I want to see if there's some useful or green one. We put a lot of blue viewers. Not <laughs> Sam. <laughs> yeah, but other ones are sure there's some here. Uh, Anneli. No. No. It was my most recent one. Maybe it hasn't even showed No, it no, yet. it hasn't. It got it got put into attention. No, no. I'm just kidding. Well, it's, it's, a Is it? one. it's a second one. This one? No. That one. All <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. That one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. How funny. <laughs> I know. No. I think it's, um, no, I, that's probably what I would say. If we had to say it the South Coast, not. Seriously. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's nothing. I thought it was an actual one, you know. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? I kept flipping through it. I was like, that's not a big deal. That's a good business. Mm -hmm. 
Is it the dotting? Is it the dotting? Is the live stream muted at this time, Jan? Okay, we, we probably could, yeah. It says, sure, hello, live. it says live at the top, recording and live at the top. We'll go ahead and mute at this time. Where we do that? Okay. All right. We're gonna gather around this. These. Uh, thank you for all the great participation. 
I just wanted to ask each of the commissioners your reflection on what you wrote down, what you have other thoughts about. I also see there's some that have some dots as well. So other things that you really think are, are priorities or something you really agree with. So do you want to start? Sure. Uh, so all of mine are on the green cards there. Um, it's kind of a mixture of things. Uh, I think the one that really you know stands out for me is uh, in is especially data uh, justice. Um, is just having the data, uh, accurate data to understand where a lot of these, you know, underserved populations actually are geographically speaking, so we can address some of those issues. Um, and I'm not sure how we address that, or even if we can, I mean, that would be a huge undertaking. Um, but I think just starting to, th to think about it is a good first step. Um, I talked a lot of uh, on the community engagement side is, you know, this concept of overrepresentation of underrepresented communities to work towards a more equitable um, world. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job of that, but I think there's always room for growth in that too. Uh, I can't read. <laughs> Jim, stretches a little bit more. Do you want to use that? Should have left my glasses on. Mm -hmm. um, home ownership, yep. Uh, to start tackling those historical inequities. And I could have put that one under historical inequities or restorative justice, uh, kind of back and forth on that one. But I really have gotten uh, on this whole concept of limited equity housing cooperatives as a way to start addressing some of these home ownership barriers. Um, so I'd love to see how the department could start assisting in that work. Um, maybe it's you know just uh, some sort of guidance document or uh, best practices for um, increasing the number of those housing co-ops around would be fantastic. And there's lots of great examples of successful um, co-ops. Um, and then under benefits and burdens, I talked about expectations we put on our uh, BIPOC community members and staff members uh, to be involved in kind of the DEI uh, front. And how do we uh, compensate those folks for doing that work? Or how do we place a burden on, on non-BIPOC non people? Uh, on accountability, I have equity, um, Lens evaluation staff reports. I think that's a fantastic idea. I'd love to see that um, in our staff reports. And it's one more thing for the staff to do, I understand, but I think it's really important just to put that front and center in all of our decision making um, documentation. And then uh, tracking progress, is, I think, is a huge part. And I have no idea how you start even start to track that progress, but I know we have to start somewhere in order to be able to show the progress. Um, so I'm fully supportive of us going down that road. I uh, love the land banking concept, uh, kind of similar to the limited equity housing co-op. Um, they can kind of go back and forth uh, and love the land back um, conversation that's, that is happening. I know already in a lot of places. Um, and then how do we as, a, as LCDC incorporate uh, rulemaking advisory committee, CIAC, LOAC, and then stakeholder community input into our decision-making process more? I think that's Great. enough for me, probably. Whoever would like to go, I don't have to. I think we're just at time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyone else on, what's on the, on the line there that is commissioners, or do you need to wrap this up? Well, I think we just, we have folks heading back towards the other side of the mountain, but the Chehalova, I think Chehalova and um, Commissioner Jacobson were just, um, able to share their one thought so far, which is on the data justice and data equity. Chair um, or Commissioner Jacobson, do you have anything else you'd like to chime in at this point? That's about as far as we got on the topic. Yeah. yeah. Other than Chair Halova saying I could pick her brain on housing. So that actually was the biggest, <laughs> the biggest <laughs> takeaway we got. So thank you. That is great. Well, Commissioner, thanks for doing the writing. I know that Anita will be transcribing and looking at this and bringing back a, a draft um, or a potential kind of series of questions for you, uh, us and the commission can perhaps name it. It doesn't have to be an equity lens. It could be a framework instead of guiding questions um, for us to consider. I think this, this exercise was mostly, or this tool is meant to be for commission as you look at rulemaking, you know, a new policy. And then I also heard some other suggestions for just simply research and projects, you know, which would be probably staff driven because um, commissioners always get uh, already give graciously of your time. Thank you. Anita, any 
Last yeah, I had, I had a thought. Oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. I just thought about this. This reminded me of um, Meyer Memorial Trust has this uh, DEI, what are they called? Spectrum tool. And it's kind of like this in that it has, I don't know how many categories they have, like 10 categories or something, but, you know, leadership and policies, they have different things. And essentially it's like a, uh, on one side of the chart, each one of them has like a, a line and on one side it says, has, haven't even started this yet, you know, addressing this. And the other one's like exemplary and there's different steps in between. And it's essentially a self-evaluation tool that uh, organizations can use to like self-evaluate, like where are we on each of these topics? And I feel like I could imagine taking these instead of their topics and, and thinking of it in the same way with regard to the department. It's just like, okay, wow, we haven't even taught about this topic or we're doing all this stuff. And I think another thing I forgot to mention was um, Commissioner Jacobson actually talked about community engagement and empowerment. Community engagement is different than community empowerment <laughs> and whether those should be w one thing or actually two things because one, empowerment a lot of times requires people to be in, in positions of power. And uh, that kind of, it's almost like decision-making and empowerment go together and community engagement something else sometimes or not. It, it's just that empowerment part seems like it's its own, it, it has, it, it means a lot more than engagement. Yeah, if I could tell a story on that, Anita, real quick. The, um, the this is Kirsten, the um, governor's Racial Justice Council staff actually swatted us back from using the term community empowerment in the CFEC rules. So, because we had to report to the Racial Justice Council, we were chosen, the CFEC team was chosen as a pilot to do budget priorities based on racial justice and community engagement. And so we're talking about, oh, we're empowering the community to do this and that. And they're like, no, you're not. The community does not get to choose yeah. these rules. This is, <laughs> I agree. <LPC> <laughs> tools. So that, that we were a little bit over our skis there, but we're, yeah. I, that's what I'm saying. I, I agree. So, uh, you know, when, when the CFAC stuff was going on, I was the sort of person being like, we should actually reduce in the sense of only put down things you actually plan to measure and or be accountable for. And so when I see, that's why when I saw empowerment there, I was like, that's great. But like, it's not linked necessarily to community engagement. It, it's its own thing. Whether we do that or not is a different decision point, but we can't equate those. Just like you said, you can't equate those together. Uh, thank you for all of your feedback. And yes, engagement and empowerment are definitely different. As a community um, organizer and advocate, um, you know, it starts when I'm coaching usually governments. It does start with engagement to understand the power. And it's not even empowerment. It's like deferring to, and there's, you know, spectrum of community engagement that you've seen. So, um, and I'm going to be doing some work with the staff. Um, as well, and some training related to that and emerging concepts, as you had mentioned. And also to mention the Meyer Spectrum tool, we did an assessment with staff that was kind of modeled under that and a number of other self-assessments too. So um, that's some of the DEI work we've been doing with staff. So this is great. It's all coming together. So I want to thank you all for um, your participation. And uh, this is a lot of information and um, you all are way ahead of many groups that I've worked with. So I'm really uh, excited to um, see this moving forward and what this could be. You know, it's, you say it's for rulemaking, but I, as a system thinker, you know, externally for the agency, how you're working with other um, agency partners, local governments, community, also internally on how you, how you work with your staff to give them the tools to do that. And also what does equity look like culturally within the staff standpoint too. So that's kind of, I'm doing all of that as well as pro providing an advice to DLCD. So I'm really thrilled to be here and we'll be back in April. Um, and again, thank you for your time and your great expertise. And most of all, just your commitment for being on the commission. Like I said, I've been following the commission for the last 25 years. Um, mm -hmm. This is the first time I've been able to really engage in this way. I was had to come for Damascus's uh, comp plan acknowledgement, <laughs> you know, big formal testimony. So this has been really great. And thank you all. It's great to see you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Deputy Director uh, Green, Anita Yap, what an inc incredibly valuable session this afternoon in all regards. We, we've been on this journey, but this is this takes us to a whole new level where we need to go. And we spend so much of our time talking about the importance of housing and addressing natural disasters and climate. And 
protecting resource lands and now equity is uh and I'm, I'm sure i'm missing the other major pillars of the program but equity is is so essential to, to everything that we do and, and where we go and this is such a great launching pad for uh for our next steps so thank you very very much um well we can conclude this item um as we we move toward adjournment here just a couple of final remarks uh uh, first, commissioners, any other business that you would like to bring up uh, to the commission or to the department while we're here together? We um, certainly invite any comments, perspectives, or online. I just want to make sure. I, I am not hearing any. Um, and I'll uh, it conclude with the way we started. You have a scorecard. So please be sure to uh, take some time before you leave to complete your scorecard and give them to Jan before you leave. Um, and on, online, you should read, receive these electronically as well with your supplemental materials. Um, and then we have a hard uh, copy in our in our folders here before us. Um, I, I would just really want to thank everybody for for attending the meeting. Um, thank you for your patience with my chairing the meeting. <laughs> um, it's been a great experience. Um, I really appreciate it. Our next meeting is uh, scheduled for April 19th to the 21st here in Salem. We all are uh, on alert that there may be a special March meeting if necessary, and, and that's great. We'll, we'll make that happen. Um, it's been great to spend a couple of days with all of you. Safe travels home. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.